A pleasure and honor that we gather here today to mark a pivotal moment in our journey towards a sustainable future in the electronic sector. We are delighted to welcome our esteemed chief guest, Mr. Alkesh Kumar Sharma, Secretary, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, whose presence adds immense significance to this occasion. His visionary leadership and dedication to advancing the electronics industry make him a guiding light for us. I would further like to welcome Mr. Pankaj Mohindu, Chairman, India Cellular and Electronics Association. Sir has been a strong advocate in supporting the Government of India's vision to establish India as the global manufacturing hub for electronics and components ecosystem. I would also like to extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished guest of honor, Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee, Scientist G and Group Coordinator, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. Dr. Chatterjee is a seasoned global policy maker and techno administrator with 25 plus years of experience translating research into commercial success and pioneering disruptive policies. Thank you, sir, for being here. I would further like to invite Mr. Sandeep Singh, Managing, Managing Director Accenture, who have partnered with ICEA to, in this initiative as knowledge partners. Mr. Singh leads Accenture's sustainability practice in India. Their deep insights and contributions have played an integral role in shaping the landscape of electronics manufacturing in our country. Their presence here today underscores their commitment to fostering an ecosystem that thrives on sustainability and innovation. We would also like to welcome our friends from the media. Thank you so much for gracing this occasion. Our audience, comprised of industry leaders, experts and stakeholders, forms the heart of this event. Uh, one of the most responsive uh, officers I have seen in my working life, which, which has been considerable. This is a very important, uh, very, very important report and I'd like to congratulate uh, all those who have been responsible in making it happen. It's very detailed and uh, I think it's, uh, it's a very robust report. We, in, uh, as you know, ICA has been striving for uh, a very massive manufacturing sector in India and consumption is also going up. Uh, the milestone of 100 billion dollars of electronic manufacturing was crossed last year, 22 23. Uh, the, our consumption is also rising, so I think the, obviously this brings about a challenge. Every good thing brings a challenge, and the challenge is the escalation in the generation of e waste. The responsibility of efficient waste management and regeneration becomes of paramount importance. I'm not going to go into the detail of the report. I'll leave it uh, for Sandeep to take that forward. What I'm extremely pained about is that, you know, there are still gaps. Uh, the, we have not been able to organize this sector. India, as usual, has had its, uh, you know, informal tweaks. For example, the cannibalization uh, industry, which in a way helps bring down the cost of repairs and it also reduces the amount of e-waste in the system. That's something which, which we have not managed, but what happened was that our, uh, the issues with the sector, with the taxation, we had very high taxation on spare parts and uh, uh, components. So at that time, people found, and you know, duties on mobile phone was zero at that time. So our innovative people found a way out of cannibalizing a product and using it uh, in uh, as spare parts, and that sort of continued in the second uh, hand market also. How are we going to change this? Uh, and I think we are going to put all our weight behind uh, changing this creating a paradigm shift. And I think that will create a massive opportunity for us of becoming a reprocessing uh, e-waste sort of capital of the world without interfering with our domestic demand and domestic manufacturing. Yeah, Mr. Pankaj Mahindu, Chairman of ICA, Mr. Sandeep Singh, Managing Director Accenture, my colleague, uh, Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee, 
Sangeeta Varma, Sudhir Baba, distinguished delegates from the industry, media, friends. This concept of waste, I think if you look at how this whole concept has come, I think this was an out, uh, you know, it, was, it was a product of industrialization. In the ancient Indian system, if you look at, I think there was hardly any concept of waste. Even our household, whatever little we had, whether it was the kitchen waste or a compound waste, it all used to go and get collected in some place and at the beginning of every season, somebody will collect that waste and take it to the farm. And same thing was happening even if you look at our, I, mean, I, I, I don't know, many of us of my age, you are all you know, people of 90s born and some of you may not be knowing that we had a culture of using our, you know, the, the books which my brother used to study, you know, when he passed out, I continued with the same books. And it was not limited only to the books, even the clothes used to get transferred, you know. So that was the concept of Indian system of, you know, there was hardly anything that was called waste. Everything will be used for something. I mean, there used to be a standard joke saying that the aapka sari old ho jata hai, toh usko khaad ke uska, you know, you make something out of that. And then you make, it used to come to, down to the level of, you know, that ponchne ka jo hota hai, you sweep your house and all that. So the whole concept of uh, uh, was that we that there is nothing called waste. Everything is a resource. Now we should know how best we can utilize that resource. And as we moved into an economic system of you know industrialization, one, two, three, we moved into a system of linear path of economic development. And the economy started doing saying that my task is only to manufacture. I am not bothered about the about the waste. Somebody else uh, will bother, you know, I make, I manufacture my product for the satisfaction of the consumer and uh, whatever goes, it will be, you know, either the effluent will be discharged into the rivers or the water bodies or the waste will be taken to the waste fields and then we created all those, those big mounds of waste which you see all around our cities. I think the time had come and I think in the last 20 years there has been a lot of awareness about how do we ensure that Every material that is produced on the earth is a resource, it's not a waste. It's a wealth and we have to create more wealth out of this waste. And so that the whole concept of waste to wealth is started. And uh, as we move into the new generation, then we started finding that now you may not even have enough raw material in the coming, you know, the next 25 years or 30 years. We will not have some of the materials which will not be available unless you recycle them. I was talking to some people, uh, cobalt, uh, hafnium, you know, there are multiple metals which, which you need into the next generation chips and uh, next generation electronic products. They will not be available. The only source that is available is you have to necessarily go for recycling those products. Take those resources out of whatever waste that has been generated. You know? so, so this process has started and I am so happy that the whole concept has been taken very well by the industry, by the stakeholders, by the government. Government has come out with circular economy policies, they have identified, Niti Aayog has come with a set of, you know, they have identified 11 sectors, Mighty has been given charge of managing our e-waste in electronics, and uh, in the last couple of years, a lot of work has been done on that. We have come out with our Center of Excellence of e-waste management, which is now doing an active work of transfer of technology, that so the, the Niti Aayog's own concept that it should not only be limited to electronics out in the in, in our daily life we should be able to, to to make use of circular economy, the whole concept of life, lifestyle for environment, which which Prime Minister has launched in COP20 as well as uh, so that is basically you know people have started using bicycles to go to office. I used to do it sometime. So it all depends on how best we can make use of circular economy doesn't have to limit only to industry, it has to percolate down to every citizen, every household, every person should say that yes, I should not waste. I think that's that's the concept which we have to go into and I am so happy that when it comes to electronic sector, we have been discussing with Mr. Pankaj that how do we you know, create a, 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 some kind of an awareness, also let's discuss with the stakeholders. 
how do we, what are the kind of specific products that should go into, what are the kind of specific steps that we need to take in order to ensure that in electronics manufacturing sector, we should minimize our waste, we should recycle, reuse, you know, uh, and, and, and see whatever can go into making, you know, recover, which we are doing in the e-waste management system. I mean, some of the best materials will be recovered in Hyderabad Center. So all these, these, these three hours of of uh, circular economy have to be actively taken and invited by each one of us, whichever sector we are working in. I think then only we will be able to take it to the next level and, and the kind of, I had just had a, a small look at the report and I think there are a lot of salient findings which uh, will actually go into making uh, India, you know, a, a leader in circular economy. You know? there's a, there's a, if you look at the kind of electronic waste that is being generated, a large part of this is being collected in the informal sector. It's an informal economy. There's a need to formalize this economy. We have to discuss with the stakeholders, with the, with the waste collectors, and then ensure that this all comes into a good place and uh, you actually get much more value out of it rather than you know, those guys picking up something and leaving something behind. So we pay a refund base. And then the market size, uh, as it's been highlighted in the report, is about 13 billion dollars. This is, this is a huge market in the next 15 years. Recycling, as I said, 90% of it is being managed by informal sector. So we have to penetrate into those sectors, formalize them into some kind of SPVs, work closely with the state governments, with other stakeholders to identify land parcels, set up clusters, set up equipment, plans for technology, which has already been developed for multiple products. And, and that has to come. So formalization is a very important step which has been highlighted in the report. And, uh, and of course, uh, we have to also look at set up standards with our body table and the material flow database, aggregation and dismantling zones have to be identified in targeted geographies, depending on the kind of waste material which is generated in different geographies, incentivizing them for you know, ensuring that they set up uh, advanced recycling facilities so that your efficiency goes up, you extract almost near 100% waste, you know, nothing should be left. And then of course the complete distribution network, and supply chain management, and then the whole system, the way uh, it has been highlighted in the report, I'm sure Mr. Sandeep will uh, talk uh, in detail about that. But I, there is a need and a necessity that it has to be an active stakeholder participation with the Ministry of Environment and the NPIO to ensure that we actually take it to the exponential level of growth. And I think I must compliment uh, Mr. Pankaj Mahindu and his team and the Accenture team for, for such a comprehensive and well-researched document. We definitely will make good use of this, and I'm sure, uh, at least in the government sector, the NPIO, the advisory and policy making bodies of the government, we should all make use of this, and, in, and, and the industry should also have a look at it. I'm sure there's a lot lot of takeaways from this report, and we should actually make those as part of our implementation strategy. With this, I would like to once again compliment the team IC and team Accenture for this great initiative. Thank you. I would like to welcome our guest of honor, Mr. Vedh Prakash Mishra, Director of Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Sir uh, joined the MOEFCC in 2021 and has been since representing it in the e-waste steering committee and actively consults stakeholders for electronics waste management in the country. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are also joined by our guest of honor, Mr. Subhim Kusena. Chief Guest, Mr. Akesh Kumar Sharma, Secretary MITI, to launch our report, Pathways to Service. Good morning, distinguished guests on the dais and dear friends. It gives me immense pleasure to be here with you all, sharing the findings from this report, which we have been working very closely alongside ICR for the past several months. I think uh, before I get started, I, I'll uh, eco search thoughts in terms of what circularity means for us as a nation. This is not something new. This has been something which has been a part of our ethos uh, for the past several decades. 
Uh, it's only now that some of these uh, more burning issues have started to emerge, which has necessitated the need for us to think about what kind of interventions, what kind of uh, measures do we need to introduce to bring back that circularity, which we are already very proud of. So what I intend to do in the next 15 to 20 minutes is share with you what are the big findings from this report that we have conducted, and also call out a few uh, challenges, opportunities that we need to be aware of as we start to really bring these opportunities to life. So uh, this is what I uh, intend to cover in the next few minutes. I'll, I'll talk about what this report is all about. I'll talk about some of the, the nuances of the Indian context. I'll also talk about what are the big findings, as I said, and then last but not the least, the way forward in terms of how do we prioritize the actions from here on. Now this is a, a quick overview of what this report is all about. This is, in my opinion, a very well-researched and a very well-informed report which has come out through collaboration of multiple stakeholders. I would be lying if I were to say that this is an Accenture or an ICI report. This is an industry report which has been brought to life with a lot of recommendations, a lot of discussions, conversations, interviews, surveys. Um, in fact, we had about 15 plus discussions with industry experts and we had about 20 site visits to be able to gather those real nuances on the ground which really define uh, the context in which we are operating. We also conducted a survey just to be able to understand what are the consumer preferences and, and perspectives which we need to think about as we start to uh, really uh, shape these interventions. Uh, the report calls out about nine policy interventions. This has been identified after a lot of evaluation, screening, and, and um, uh, you, know, you know, thinking in terms of what is the ease of implementation, what is the impact potential. And there is almost about a $20 billion worth of opportunity which, which we as a nation can realize by driving circularity in the electronic segment. Now I think uh, before we delve into the real recommendations, this is a quick view of the context. Obviously, we as a nation have already started uh, thinking about circularity. We have taken a lot of initiatives. If you think about the e-waste management rules, which were earlier introduced in 2016, and the amendments came out uh, recently, there is a lot of good uh, impetus in terms of how could we try circularity. There is a lot of uh, direction in terms of what could be the way forward for us to think about circularity and really accelerating our transformation. When we think about specs, uh, again, a lot of incentivization, a lot of measures which have been introduced to accelerate and incentivize the key stakeholders to drive circularity. So all of this is a precursor or a, or a foundation on which we are trying to build out. We are not starting anything new. It, it's really for us to think about how do we le leverage all the goodness that comes along with these kind of interventions and then start to accelerate. Uh, that's one part of it. And then also, as we started to think about these interventions, we wanted to make sure that we are not thinking about circularity in the electronics sector in India uh, uh, in isolation. So obviously, we do want to get inspired by what has worked in some of the other geographies, while being fully conscious about the fact that we have a different Indian context that we need to cater to. So I talked about the, the, the reliance on the informal sector and, and some of the very specific nuances. We have to think about how do we capitalize on that as opposed to thinking about just uh, you know, a way to formalize it. So, so there has to be a kind of a middle ground which capitalizes on the, on the goodness of the informal sector while bringing out the art of possible uh, which some of the Western countries have already accomplished. So that's the background and of course as I said the intention is to identify those pathways. Now, uh, before we delve into the, the, the exact interventions, I think one key point I want to share with you all is uh, what is the context in which we are trying to think about circularity and this is where one has to do a, a diligent job of understanding the overall material flow because circularity is a thing which can manifest in multiple forms. Of course, downstream uh, pathways in terms of recycling are things which are very relevant and are very familiar in the Indian context, but there is a lot more that plays within circularity when we think about it from the perspective of end to end value chains. So, so circularity is not something which is just focused on one part of the value chain, but extends end to end. So the first thing that we really did was to understand what is the volume of material flow which flows through the different pathways uh, in the Indian context. And what we found was that if there is a particular device which is currently in use, and let's say we're talking about iPhones or you know mobile phones or laptops, essentially it can, as time elapses, it can undergo four or five pathways. One, it can continue to be in use if, if it is in that condition and shape. Second, it can undergo some kind of repairs and then again can continue to be used in the same uh, to the same kind of ownership. Third, it can possibly undergo a change of life, that is, get a second life in which there is a transfer of ownership which takes place. And then fourth, of course, there is also a possibility that it reaches the end of life, 
which is where some of those recycling initiatives start to come to life. Now, what we found was that there is almost about 550 million devices in use. And uh, as we move forward in terms of where exactly are the material flows happening, we found that almost 120 million of these devices tend to get into the, the end of life stream, which is where some of those recycling initiatives start to take place. Now, the key point I want to share with you here all is that depending on which, which pathway within uh, the overall value chains a particular device gets into, the kind of circularity model that one can activate would differ. So, so for instance, downstream typically is very recycle focused, while if you're thinking about the use phase, where we're talking about repairs or refurbishment or, or second life options, things like repair model or refurbishment model would be much more important. And then of course there are also upstream models in the form of product as a service or eco-design and those kind of things which are very design centric, which can be taken into account to drive circularity. Now, I, I do want to touch upon each of these three stages of the value chain distinctly because they, that's where the richness of the interventions that we have identified resides. So let's think about what happens in the, in the downstream phase. Now, uh, as I said, there are about 550 million devices which are currently in use. And at the end of the year, typically our research shows that there are about 120 million devices which typically go into the end of life, uh, the pathway. And there are also about 75 million devices which tend to reach that stage but continue to reside in the residential houses just because there isn't a mechanism or a formal uh, kind of a way for them to come bring back to the, into the value chains. So we did a research, we thought about what does it mean if, if we look at the overall idle inventory which currently exists, it's almost about 206 million devices, which is a lot. Now we started to think about how could we really bring these devices back into the value chain and what we found was that there is there are a few challenges that we need to overcome. So for example, when we talked to the consumers through a survey, what we found was that almost 40% 40, 40 of the consumers told us that they are uh, holding at least four or more devices in their houses. So clearly alludes to the fact that there is this kind of a challenge as well as an opportunity to bring these devices back into the ecosystem. We started to think about exactly what are the reasons for the consumers to be holding them or just keeping them inside the residential houses as idle inventory. Why are they not bringing it back? I think a few reasons that we heard from them was, one, there is a lack of incentivization. They, they don't necessarily see the value in, in bringing them back into the value chains. Second, there was also a concern that some consumers highlighted that these are the devices which contain their personal information and, and they were not confident of the mechanisms to be able to take care of this kind of personal sensitive data and hence uh, they, they choose to not do anything with these devices and rather just keep them as idle inventory. And third, there was also uh, sometimes a lack of awareness. Many of the consumers that we spoke with uh, told us that they are not even aware of what kind of options exist when it comes to really bringing these uh, idle devices back into the value chain. So that's one challenge that we observed in the form of uh, you know managing the downstream waste uh, that, that currently exists. And waste not, not in the sense of waste, but, but you know, things which are kind of locked up with, with the full value not being extracted. The second challenge that we observed was, and, and I'll not call it a challenge, but a really an observation or a nuance that we need to be aware of, is a heavy dependence on the informal sector. So I already touched upon that and what we found through our research as well as when we think about collection activity, almost 90% of it is contributed by the informal sector. And when we think about the recycling activity, almost 70% of it really happens through the informal sector. Now, this is one thing which we need to uh, really think about as a huge opportunity which really differentiates us from a lot of Western countries because this is possibly a big strength if you were to be able to capitalize on this kind of an ecosystem that already exists. At the same time, there are also a few challenges and nuances that, that we need to be aware of. So, for example, the heavy dominance of informal sector essentially results in, in uh, you know, some kind of underfinancing which currently exists in the form of waste management ecosystem. We, we did speak with a lot of industry experts across different types of players and what we found was that when we think about uh, you know, what are the price points at which some of these uh, e-waste materials are available in the upstream parts of the value chain, we found that there is almost about rupees 30 to 45 per kg of phone or something like a 20 rupees 20 per kg of laptop, which is a prevalent price upstream when, when players think about really bringing it back into their uh, purview. But our research shows that this price point is very low as compared to what the actual price of EPR implementation should be.
electronics. First question is, uh, what is the profile of these devices? Are most of these mobile handsets or do they also include accessories, old uh, PC parts? Yeah. Uh, are you doing uh, anything or is it actually like millions, hundreds of millions of mobile phones? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's inclusive of all of these components, but predominantly mobile phones and laptops. You know, that is uh, the, the major chunk of this added inventory. Uh, in fact, when I talk about uh, this, this stat that I shared with you, that almost four to five idle devices are being voted by, let's say, a particular uh, you know consumer, forty percent of those. That was predominantly iPhones, mobile phones, laptops, you know, those kind of things. But but to your point, it does include other types of devices. Uh, there is request media friends to kindly wait for the end of the presentation to be done and the marks by. parts of the overall value chain and we were talking about the recycling infrastructure. We, we talked about the fact that uh, it's a bit fragmented in the sense that there are about 60% of the registered uh, recyclers which have a capacity of less than 1000 tons per annum and we also talked about the fact that uh, some of the technologies which are required to extract those uh, difficult to extract but high value items in the form of let's say uh, precious metals from PCBs or, or you know things like uh, displays etc. Uh, those technologies might not be as easily accessible in the Indian context, which is again an opportunity for us to think about. Now, that's a little bit about what we have observed in the form of material flows in the downstream part, but then turning our attention to some of the policy recommendations which have emerged, which the report touches upon. Uh, the report talks about the, the opportunity to really accelerate public-private partnerships to be able to drive the take-back programs. It talks about the fact that one will need to think about two key levers uh, if you were to really bring back that inventory which is currently locked up, which is about really incentivization uh, and the second is about convenience. And incentivization is really about, if you're thinking about uh, a value which is embedded in some of this ideal inventory, uh, one has to think about what are the right mechanisms to make sure that this value gets distributed across the value chain. And when I say distributed across the value chain, it includes the different partners uh, or players in the overall value chain as well as the consumer because that's the only way for the consumer to be incentivized to really bring it back into the productive value chain. So, you know, there could be things like uh, vouchers uh, that, that the consumer can actually uh, obtain for, for return of the, the, the used devices at the right kind of uh, touch points or sale points. There could be more uh, focus in the form of uh, price discovery. What is that right value? I mean, this in itself is a big question which is not easy to answer. So, what kind of price discovery mechanisms can be introduced? So, the policy uh, interventions that you've talked about touch upon those kind of elements as well. The second thing is that uh, when we're thinking about, uh, again, the same point around bringing back some of this inventory, things like data sanitation, for example. There are issues that some of the consumers have expressed in the form of uh, uh, confidentiality or trust associated with some of those personally sensitive information. So, so one would need to think about what kind of mechanisms can be introduced to really uh, give them the comfort that when they do return their uh, idle devices, there is nothing risky that they are getting into. Then the, uh, the second intervention that we have called out in the report is really about some of these third party standards and, and data flow uh, kind of uh, databases which can be used to bring in more transparency. Now when we think about some of these standards, quite clearly given the fact that it's a very heavily informal dominated sector that we are talking about, some of those, uh, those nuances do mean that the transparency or, or some of the, the activities which happen across the value chain, there isn't a lot of visibility or control that can be obtained uh, by the right kind of uh, players in the ecosystem. So what kind of standards do we need to introduce? And here what we found was that one doesn't need to uh, really start from scratch. There are standards which, which one can actually get inspired from in the form of, for example, EN 5625. These are some of the standards which are being used in the EU, uh, which are used to define the, the right kind of activities which are environmentally, socially, responsibly you know, uh, accepted. Uh, now, I'm not saying that these can be adopted as they are, but one can adapt them to the Indian context, but there is a good starting point. Similarly, when we think about the data flows or, or the material flows, that's again a big kind of a gap which needs to be certainly addressed because unless we can obtain that clear picture of where exactly the devices are flowing and what kind of recycling activities are happening and what kind of values being extracted, 
there isn't a lot of control that can be exercised by the ecosystem as a whole. So, so there are these kind of rep tool kind of uh, data flows or material flows which one can get inspired from again, which are being adopted in the in the Western world. So that's the second thing that we have uh, called out. Uh, the third policy intervention is really about government-led data aggregation and dismantling, uh, material aggregation and dismantling zones. Now, over the last several years, naturally a lot of uh, e-waste hubs have evolved in the Indian context. For example, in Delhi itself, there are about 15 regions which are identified as, as e-waste uh, hubs. Now, while they have evolved and they are very competitive and they are very operationally efficient, just the fact that it's a bit informal in nature, there are some of the challenges which one needs to think about in terms of you know, eliminating some of the externalities or eliminating some of the, the socially unacceptable practices, for instance, in the form of probably child labor or, or the fair wages. Now, what can be done to really address those? Uh, there is, again, some kind of inspiration that we can uh, kind of uh, adopt. For example, there was this, uh, you know, the, the city or the town in China, which was like the Gihu town which was recognized as the, as the largest e-waste hub globally. And this was very heavily informal sector dominated. There were almost about 5,000 informal sector units which existed in that hub. Now, in about 2013, the government had taken an initiative to, uh, to infuse about $235 million worth of capital investment to really transform that predominantly informal sector dominated hub into a much more organized uh, e-waste sector, uh, e-waste management uh, park of sorts. And as it stands today, those 5,000 informal sector units which inhabited that, that entire city have been kind of aggregated or you know brought together to house to be housed under 29 recycling units in the form of 500 you know organized workshops. So so again, easier said than done, but but there are inspirations that one can take in terms of how do we capitalize on some of these markets like Bafar or Silampur to to really bring the the you know some of that more organization in the in the foundation that already exists. And lastly, from a downstream perspective, uh, the report touches upon the, the, the need for incentivization of high yield recycling technology, which is able to really um, extract some of those precious metals, those 20% uh, hard to extract but high value items that I talked about, which are also hazardous. Uh, it does require some kind of sophisticated smelting and refining technologies. Um, there are some indigenous technologies, by the way, which are already prevalent, which, which are being deployed in the Indian context, but there is anecdotal evidence that it's not necessarily commercially viable at scale, because had that been the case, it would have already been adopted uh, across uh, all the recycling units. So, so again, there are good starting points and there are opportunities to get inspired from some of these technologies. You know, players like Umicore or Glencore do specialize in some of these technologies which can be used to extract gold. Now, that was a little bit about the downstream thing. Now, if we turn our attention to the to the use phase, now in the use phase again there are opportunities for us to think about what happens with the with the e-devices which are going to get repaired or which which are possibly going to get a second life. And the distinction being that when we talk about repair, we are really talking about the ownership remaining the same, which is to say that you know the same user continues to use the the the, the device uh, after a few weeks. While when we talk about refurbishment or a resale model, essentially. <coughs> the ownership changes from one consumer to the other. What we found was that uh, on a yearly basis, there are about 55 million devices which do get the need to get repaired. Uh, of these about 55 million devices, almost 60% of repairs happen through the informal sector. There are about 15% of, of repairs which happen through brand-owned service centers, and then there are also about 3% of, of repairs which happen through multi-brand health service providers, which are more formal, but very small in scale. And then uh, we also found through the research that there are about 22% of the, the devices which continue to get used in the same form despite needing the re repair, they don't necessarily get repaired. The, the consumer takes a call to really continue with it, which could be like a broken screen or, or you know, some of the defects which warrant a repair. Now the big uh, you know, opportunity area for, for us as an ecosystem to think about is how could that 3% which comes from the multi-brand third-party service providers be scaled up? And the report touches upon some of the challenges which we need to be overcome. So, for example, um, things like provenance, for instance, or, or things like uh, uh, you know access to spare parts, for instance. Those are the kind of uh, challenges or, or areas which need to be addressed if one were to really think about how do we scale these kind of uh, uh, formalized third-party service center-based repairs. If we turn our attention to the refurbished model again, what we found was that currently, as I said, the scale is fairly small, just about three million devices out of about 53 million devices which can potentially be 
undergoing a change of ownership actually get refurbished. And when we talked to the experts, what we realized was there are, there are challenges with respect to, let's say, provenance, for instance. So, for example, a refurbisher always worries that if there is a stolen device which enters their inventory, uh, there could be some law and regulation kind of uh, challenges that he, uh, the, the refurbisher might need to um, think about. So, these are some of the things which, which possibly need to be addressed. So, so, you know, standards which can be brought in or, or you know, some kind of... Um, chain of custody mechanisms which can establish the, 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 the chain of uh, ownership, how it flows, are critical for, for this kind of a model to evolve at scale. And lastly, if we were to turn our attention to the, to the upstream parts of the value chain, this is where uh, we are really thinking about design considerations. Now, really when you think about embedding circularity from a design consideration, there are two essential things that one has to think about. One, how do you reduce the use of virgin material and increase the use of recycled content, that is one. And second, how could you design for more repairability or recyclability or refurbishability? Now this again is a space wherein some good movement has already happened in the form of Metis draft eco-design, uh, you know, the, the, the principles that have come through. There is a lot of goodness that exists already. I think uh, what the report calls out is an opportunity for us to really prioritize and orient some of these considerations towards really accelerating the use of circular uh, secondary materials or recycled materials. Uh, in the in the value chain. Now, uh, and of course, the last uh, one that we have talked about from from upstream perspective is product as a service model. Uh, again, a very promising model, but still in early stages or nascent stages from the Indian context perspective. Now, uh, each of these interventions is obviously detailed. One would really get into a lot of depth in terms of the impact potential, the challenges, the ease of implementation, and which is what the report. Is, is really bringing out. So I would love for you all to really go through that. But the idea for me was to give you a flavor of what kind of initiatives or interventions have been identified through the study. Now, this is a, a view that I wanted to flash for your consideration. I mean, this is a quick summary of what is the impact potential that can be realized through all of these nine policy interventions that you talked about. And in doing so, what we have tried to do is not just focus on the economic value created, but also the more broader definition of value, which entails some of those negative externalities from a social or environmental perspective, which need to be addressed. So we talk about jobs created potential. We talk about emissions avoided uh, potential as a part of each of these policy interventions. Quite clearly, what has emerged is that when you think about some of those downstream interventions, there is a lot of, lot of uh, value that can be realized in the form of avoided waste or, or in the form of some of the emissions impact uh, kind of considerations, so more social and environmental. While we continue to, uh, you know, build upon the operational rigor or the operational efficiencies that that some of that recycling ecosystem currently brings in, in the Indian context, as we move our attention towards more of use phase and upstream parts of the value chain, the the kind of uh, value realization potential distribution shifts more towards the economic side of things as well. Now, this again is a summary of of you know all the the different types of impacts that can be realized through these interventions. Uh, but then what we have also done is identify what would it mean for us as a nation to start to think about realizing these interventions. Of course, we can't be doing everything at once, but what we have realized is that from where we stand today, with all the, the work that has happened in the form of EPR guidelines or, or EBS management rules, there are three or four distinct pathways that one could take from here on. One, of course, is we continue as is in the business as usual form. And then, of course, one could take a call to, to focus more on, let's say, use phase or down, uh, downstream phase or upstream phase kind of uh, interventions. Our recommendation is that we take a systems approach wherein we think about each of these nine recommendations in, in totality. Uh, of course, there could be focus in terms of which ones do we want to deploy first versus which ones come in the, in the uh, medium to long term. But really, a systems approach is what will bring in that kind of a combinatorial impact. And then what we had seen on the previous slide, which was more of siloed intervention by intervention impact potential, that gets magnified if we were to take a systems approach. And this is a summary of that. So, so for instance, a systems approach would help us realize about two and a half billion dollars in incremental profits, uh, which, is, which is more than the aggregate sum of what we would realize in incremental profits if we were to implement each of those initiatives in isolation. That number stands at 1.7 billion dollars. So, so that delta is really coming from the, the systems impact which can be realized. And similarly, as I said, we have taken a very holistic view of impact. So we talk about jobs created, we talk about waste avoided, emissions avoided. Almost about 132,000 additional jobs can be realized as a part of the systems approach implementation that we're talking about. And before I conclude, I'll just call out the fact that 
when we were doing all of these uh, analysis and discussions, what we realized was that each of these interventions will take a different type of an approach to, to implement or to execute. There are a few things which are more of quick wins. So for example, if you're talking about introducing new standards or refurbishment standards or, or authorizing some kind of certification programs which can alleviate the challenges associated with, let's say, something like a limited bandwidth that CCTV might have. You know, these are the things which are probably quick wins, which don't require any massive capital investment. But as compared to that, if you were to think about, let's say, investing in recycling technologies or digging in that kind of uh, pyrometallurgical capabilities with some of these players like Unicor and, and Linkor for this, of course that will take some investments, of course that will take some more effort to, to bring it to life and those could be more of medium to long term uh, kind of initiatives. So what we have done is identified out of these five interventions, which are the four or five that we feel are going to be the quick wins or, or relatively easier to implement which we could focus on in the next one to two years versus the things which probably are going to be for the medium to, to long term, let's say uh, after two years of, uh, of efforts that, that we couldn't take. So with that, I'll take a pause. I do realize that there is a lot of data, there is a lot of detailing that has happened. I've tried my best to, to strike the right balance of not getting into too much depth versus keeping it too superficial. But, but the report that you would be able to read really goes into the details of each of these implementations, talking about challenges, numbers, detailing out you know, the, the impact potential. So I do hope that it provides the right kind of stimulus and the right kind of inputs for the government officials as well as all the stakeholders here in the room uh, to really start to think about accelerating our transition to circular economy. With that, I, I'll take a pause and happy to take any questions. The birth of opportunity is what it is and it manifests in multiple forms. For example, um, you know, I was talking about extracting precious metals, for instance, from, from some of these e-waste, which constitutes a 20% hard to extract high value items. That itself is about $1.5 billion in the form of gold uh, that can be extracted. And, and the reality also is that a lot of uh, you know, countries have already started to realize this. So for example, I'm not sure if you're aware, Japan, you know, a few years back, used uh, gold extracted from electronic waste to build their uh, gold medals for the, for the Olympic teams. Now, you know, th these are the kind of small opportunities which can be realized, but aggregated $20 billion worth of opportunity with 132,000 jobs created and 1.6 million, uh, uh, you know, We'll take the questions later on once uh, the addresses are complete. Um, so I would like to invite our uh, guest of honor, Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee, scientist G and group coordinator, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, to share a few words with us. Sri Sandeep Singh, uh, Veer Prakash Ji, my colleague from MOEF, and also Subindu Sinaji, advisor Niti Aayog. I'm very happy today that uh, First uh, association, ICA, at least endorsed whatever Ministry of Electronics has come out with the action plan in 2021. Actually, Niti Ayogs has taken the 11 different verticals and they have found the material is a real challenge for our economic growth. We are aspiring for $5 trillion economy by 2026. And electronics is one of the important contributor of entire across the sectors, across the value chain to grow our economy. If you are talking about smartphone, if you are talking about smart device, you go to the high end car, everywhere you will be finding the electronics. We are also aspiring for having semiconductor value chain in the country. Where is the material? By 2027, we are aspiring to have 400 billions of electronics in our country. And as a thumb rule, as I can quote Mr. Sony.